So we're looking at zero first and second order. And we can see that my icon for this first page is the shroud, the, the imprint of um, the face of Jesus, according to scholars, on the shroud of Turin, which is appropriate, I guess, because today is Ash Wednesday. Anyway, uh, let me go ahead and um, start this. So we, when we looked at the last problem that we did, okay, when we looked at the last problem, then you guys saw that the order for propene was first, okay? The order for um, ammonia was second, the order for uh, oxygen was third. The exponent based on the concentration is the order, and that's what we are looking at in this particular uh, discussion right here, okay? So those are the order. And that's a pretty sophisticated reaction. We're gonna be looking at more simplistic reactions here. So zero first and second order. So let's take a look at this right here. Uh, this is an outline of what we are covering in this particular section, okay? The rate law, the differential rate law and the integrated rate law. For those of you who are taking calculus, you know about the derivative and you know about the, the um, integral, okay? So let's take a look at zeroth order. Zeroth order just tells you that the, the exponent for a chemical is zero. Anything to zero power is just one. 38 to the zeroth is one. 1,270 to the zero is one. Anything to zero power is one, okay? So this basically tells you that this number right here is one, which means that the rate for this reaction is constant. For zero order kinetics, it's constant, and that rate is going to be equal to the rate constant K. And um, this is the integrated rate law, where we say this comes from the fact that rate is equal to dA dt in calculus. And that's just equal to K. So remember calculus, what you do to solve that is you separate the variables and then you integrate. And if you do this math, that's the solution that you get. So first order kinetics, first order kinetics is, uh, the, cons the chemical is now raised to the first power, which means the rate is directly proportional to the concentration of the chemical that is influencing the speed of the reaction. So again, how did we get this? We get it based on the fact that the rate is equal to dA dt, and that's just K times A. That's based on that because this is the first power right here. So what do you do is you separate the variables, dA over um, A equals K dt. And then you do the calculus. You'll see that shortly, okay? But this is the solution. Don't worry about the calculus. Just remember the solution because that's what you will be using in, in, in um, kinetics, you will just be using these solutions. Uh, second order is going to be the chemical to the second power. And if you do the calculus, it'll be one over A is equal to KT. K, remember, is the rate constant. K is the rate constant. And then the chemical in brackets is the concentration of that chemical whatever that species is, could be propane, could be ammonia, could be oxygen. And the bracket tells you it's molarity. Whenever you see a chemical and you have brackets around it, it tells you that it's in solution, aqueous solution, and that the units for that are molar, moles per liter, okay? That's what the bracket means in, in chemistry. So that's what we have right here. Uh, for second order kinetics. So these are the solutions. This is what we're going to be looking at in this particular um, discussion. Let's take a look at zeroth order kinetics. I'm gonna go through each one of these uh, 
one by one. Zeroth order kinetics tells you that the chemical itself doesn't in influence the speed. It's going to have a constant speed. For example, for example, if you've got smog, N2O, and you want to break it down to its uh, safety chemical, safe chemicals like nitrogen and oxygen, then that's a zero order kinetics problem. Uh, it breaks down to N2 and oxygen. This is the reaction right here, is zero order kinetics. And you would normally put, remember, this is the reactant. So you would say K is equal to N2O to the zero power. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, why, why is it the zero? Why is it, why is it not two? And you got two from here. Because the order does have nothing to do with the um, stoichiometry. Okay, the order has nothing to do with the stoichiometry. The stoichiometry relates one chemical to the other, but it's not related to the coefficient in the stoichiometry. That is the order, okay? So please keep that in mind. Please keep that in mind. So anything to the zero power is just one, of course. So that's just K. The rate is equal to K, as we have right here. Okay. Um, the detailed molecular pathway taken in a chemical reaction is called the reaction mechanism. Reaction mechanisms consist of one or more elementary steps. Here we will consider an important type of elementary step in which two molecules or ions come together in a reaction. When methyl chloride is attacked by a hydroxide ion in a solvent such as alcohol, the hydroxide ion approaches the carbon atom from the side opposite that of the chloride. Carbon, which is sp3 hybridized, changes its geometry as a new bond begins to be formed with oxygen, and the carbon-chlorine bond is weakened. At the midpoint of the reaction, the three hydrogens form a planar arrangement around the carbon. The energy increases to a maximum at the transition state as the reaction proceeds. The chlorine departs as a chloride ion, and the hydroxyl group is bonded to carbon, forming methyl alcohol. Notice that the arrangement of hydrogens about the carbon atom has inverted. The process we have diagrammed is often referred to as nucleophilic substitution. Okay, so this is zeroth order kinetics. First order kinetics is this, that's when the um, chemical in this particular case, carbon-14, plays a role in the reaction rate. First order process, the rate of change of concentration of a substance is proportional to the concentration of the substance at that point in time. Suppose we begin with a unit concentration and follow the disappearance of the substance over time. We note that it takes 3.5 seconds for the concentration to reach one half of the initial value. This time is called the half-life of the reaction. As the reaction proceeds, it takes another 3.5 seconds for the concentration to diminish to one-fourth of the initial concentration. Thus, this second half-life is the same length as the first. The third half-life is also 3.5 seconds long. In each successive half-life, the concentration of reactant drops to half that at the beginning of the half-life period. Notice that all half-lives are of the same length. The constancy of half-life is a distinguishing characteristic of a first-order reaction. So that's a first-order reaction. And for those of you who remember nuclear chemistry, all nuclear process are first order kinetics, okay? Um, me, this is second order kinetics. Second order kinetics, again, you can see in this particular case, the rate, and it's the chemical uh, that's being monitored to the second power. And an example of that is NO2 breaking down to NO and oxygen, or um, this is chloroform plus hydroxide forming methanol and chlorine. Those are all part of second order kinetics. I'm gonna skip the movie for now. So let's take a look at the zeroth order. Again, you can see that uh, rate is equal to K, A to the zeroth power. That's the um, differential rate law. And what we did was we separate the variables. This of course goes to one. 
and rate is DA DT. So that's basically what we have right here. And remember, because it's a chemical, it, a reactant, we have a negative because it's disappearing and that's equal to K. And what we do is we um, separate the variables. DT will go over here. And what we get is this right here. And the solution to that is this equation right here. Okay. Now, what we do a lot in kinetics is we take an equation and we always try to put it in, in the form of a line. Remember the equation for line, y equals mx plus b. And the reason why we like to do that is because then we can do a series of analysis and we can get really good information from that. When we can correlate it to a line, get information for, from that. And that's, again, what you guys will be doing in experiment number one. So if we take the solution here, and what we do, of course, is this is this right here is KT. And this right here is integrated from uh, 0 to some time T. And when we do that, that's A minus A naught. A naught, can you see that? That's the initial, the initial concentration. So you have an initial amount that you start with. So we designate that by a naught. The, the small zero at the bottom is called a naught for those of you who already know that in math. And so what we do is we have this equation, we simplify it in the form of y equals mx plus b. And now we have an equation of a line where Y is the concentration of A at any point in time. Mx is minus K over T, which means that the slope is minus K, okay? The, the uh, independent variable X is time. So we're progressing the reaction with time. And then the intercept is the initial concentration. So you can see that if you have concentration of A, that rate is constant. And what you should have is this simple plot that the um, concentration drops and the slope is constant. Remember, slope is rise over the run. Um, so for zeroth order, you basically have a straight line because the, uh, the rate is going to be constant. So, so that's a zeroth order kinetics. Um, the half-life is when, let's go back. The half-life is when, let's say that that's A naught. A naught over two is when the, cons, the original concentration drops down to half its value. Well, that time increment is called the half-life, okay? And so you can do this, and then you can go back to that equation and solve for um, some variable. And you can see that if the half-life is, say, one hour, then that means that the concentration of the chemical after one hour will go down its, its original value. After two hours, it's now a quarter, because half of one half is a one, one fourth. It's a quarter of its original value. So this, this is basically the curve that we have, OK? Again, zeroth order kinetics. This is the equation of line. We can solve for T one half using that variable. And so we can see that by doing that, you can see that the half-life for zeroth order kinetics, and you can write this down, or it's actually found in your lab manual at the very back, is equal to the initial concentration divided by 2K. So the half-life of... Uh, Zeroth order kinetics depends on the amount that you originally have and the rate of the reaction. That's basically that. What is a great example for zeroth order kinetics? A great example is the meta metabolism of alcohol. Now, you guys already did um, an ex. Um, problem BAC, where you calculate the concentration. Well, guess what? Uh, the reason why it's constant, okay, the, the, um, the metabolism of alcohol in your body is constant is because it's zeroth order kinetics. Alcohol will break down to acetic acid. That's why drunk people 
smell like vinegar because what happens is that when they drink too much ethanol, then that gets metabolized to acetic acid. And what is the main ingredient in, in vinegar? Acetic acid, 5%, okay? Let me just remind you that another alcohol that is very related to ethanol, and you'll see this in activity four, is methanol. If someone should ever consume methanol, then that is broken down similarly to ethanol, where that OH group now becomes um, carboxylic acid functional group. And so this right here will turn into this. Okay. And that chemical right there is a nasty chemical. It looks very simple, okay? But it's a nasty chemical in which our body cannot metabolize. That is formic acid. Formic acid is a chemical that fire ants put out to make this thing hurt. Formic acid will accumulate in your retina and make you blind. So what has happened in the past is people who will make moonshine will spike it with methanol because they don't know their chemistry, okay? They figure one alcohol is as good as another. Some of them might even spike it with uh, rubbing alcohol, isopropanol, which is just as bad, but methanol is even worse because when the body metabolizes it, then it forms this formic acid and eventually it'll blind that person who's consuming that, that um, alcohol that's been spiked with methanol and eventually will kill them. It'll mess up the liver, it'll mess up the kidneys, it'll mess up the body. So never, never consume methanol or any type of alcohol. The only one that's safe in moderation is ethanol, okay? In moderation. And you guys already did the calculation as far as how much it takes before you get, you are over the limit. Anyway, um, that's just a side story. So this is a zeroth order kinetics, okay? And for one ounce, typical person who weighs probably about 150 pounds, it takes about five hours to metabolize one ounce, okay? It takes about um, per hour, you metabolize this alcohol so you don't have that ethanol in your body anymore. Instead, you have vinegar. It's about 0.2 ounce per hour, okay? It's zeroth order kinetics. And it's catalyzed um, by enzymes in your body. Anyway, that's a, um, another story. So let's take a look at first order kinetics. First order kinetics is, is this right here. Notice that the rate is going to be this. This number one makes it first order kinetics. If that number is two, it'll be second order kinetics. If that number is three, it's third order kinetics, which we won't be studied. Okay. So this is the DADT. That's this right here. And then we separate the variables and then we um, go ahead and integrate it. And this is the solution. This is, the, this is what you will remember. Well, really not that. Um, what you will want to remember is the linear form. So let me um, erase this real quick. Okay, this is, this is the form that you want to remember. The natural log of the initial concentration, remember A naught here is the initial amount, is e minus the natural log of the concentration at time t. When you don't have a variable there, that means at time t sometime later is equal to the rate constant k times the time. So if, it, if you're looking at um, the constant, if you're trying to calculate how much you have after three hours, then you put three hours here, you put the rate constant here, and you put your initial concentration right there, and then you can solve for the amount you would have in three hours. That's what these equations are good for, okay? You can calculate the concentration after some time that it has elapsed. So this is the equation that we have after putting it in a form of y equals mx plus b. Why do we want y equals mx plus b? Sign, scientists just like to put it in the equation of a line. And you'll see that in our course a lot, y equals mx plus b, 
okay? Uh, that means that the rate constant is the slope. The intercept is the natural log of the initial concentration. Not the initial concentration, but the natural log. LN is the natural log. LOG is the log they stand. You guys should be able to find this in your calculator. Okay, so here's what typical data will, will look like. As, as we increase the concentration of some chemical, the rate goes up proportionally. When we quadruple the concentration, we quadruple the rate. When we change the concentration to eight times its original value, the rate also goes up to eight times its original value. And that's because it's a first order kinetics, first order kinetics. This is what the graph will look like. Okay, this is what the graph will look like. Let me clean this up. And you can see that the slope K right here is equal to well, the slope is equal to K, okay? That slope M is equal to minus K, as shown right there. This intercept, that's where it, um, the, uh, this line goes through the uh, Y axis at, at T equals zero. That intercept is the natural log of the initial concentration. So that, that's what um, first order kinetics look like. And um, here it is again. If you plug in T one half here, and we make this A naught over two, because remember, at the half life, the concentration of the original, um, the concentration at that time is equal to the original concentration divided by two. That's why we make that. And then we basically solve the math. What we get is we solve for T one half. T one half is equal to 0.693, which is actually 0.693 equals the natural log of two. Okay, that's where that number comes from. Uh, it's 0.693 over K, it's 0.693 over K. So T one half is going to depend on the rate constant K, the reciprocal of the rate constant, but it's equal to 0.693 over K. Okay, that's half-life. It, it is not a function of the original concentration, unlike zeroth order kinetics. Notice that there is no A in that equation. So it doesn't matter how much you have for first order kinetics, it's going to have a, a half-life that is determined based on the rate constant, K. So if you remember, um, your chem 152 radioactivity is first order kinetics. That's why when you want to have, say, a radioactive material decay to, to a smaller size so it's less harmful, you can't accelerate it. It's constant. It doesn't matter how much you have, it's going to decay at a certain amount. And so um, let's just take a look at um, carbon 14 because that's a radioactive material, okay? Carbon-14 is actually created in the atmosphere by nitrogen-14 absorbing a nucleus, a neutron, and converting over to carbon-14 and hydrogen, okay? Now, what happens is that the carbon-14 will react with oxygen and you form carbon dioxide. So you can get, there's a lot of carbon dioxide that is radioactive, but not enough to kill us. Okay, what happens to that carbon dioxide is that the plants will eat it, and then we consume the plants. And when we consume the plants, okay, right here, then it's part of us, but then we breathe out carbon dioxide. So what we have is plants, it goes into here, some of the uh, carbon in plants are going to be radioactive. We consume the plants and we get it in our body and there's a steady concentration. The amount of carbon-14 that goes in us, yes, we are partially radioactive. The amount of carbon-14 that goes in us is equal to the amount of carbon-14 that leaves us in terms of carbon dioxide. So we have a steady concentration while we are alive. Once we drop dead, okay, then we do not breathe out anymore. The amount of carbon-14 that is in our tissue is fixed. 
uh, in our bones, it's fixed. Okay, they'll decay over time, but the what will happen is that carbon-14 that is in us is going to decay over time and convert to something else. Okay, so that's how we carbon date li once living uh, systems. We know how much carbon-14 the living systems will have. We can go in there and analyze the amount of carbon-14 that is remain in the residual uh, tissues or residual item. So we have the initial, we have the um, amount of carbon-14 at time equals T. And now we can do the math to calculate the time that has elapsed. And that's how we carbon date um, items. The problem with carbon dating is that the half-life is only 5,730 years, okay? And usually by 10 half-lives, there's not enough carbon-14 for our sophisticated instrument to detect. What does that mean? It means that after 10 half-lives, the reliability of carbon dating goes down. There's too much error. There's too much uncertainty because there's not enough sample. So if someone ever tells you, yeah, we know those dinosaurs, uh, exact age, like 1,348,000, 20 years old, they're lying because we never carbon date dinosaurs because they're too old. At most, at most, we can carbon date an item that's about 50,000 years old, okay? Because that's about 10 times the half-life. Anything older, uh, we don't have enough carbon-14 to make reliable measurements. We use some other radioactive substance to, to uh, do that. So, that's that basically it. So we, we've done a number of carbon dating uh, things. This is Atsiman um, with all the climate changes, the snow in the Alps have been melting. Of course, we, you wouldn't know it based on the weather uh, that we were having this winter, but uh, when it's warm, it's been melted and somebody found this skeleton. And they actually thought when they stumbled up on it, this happened, I think, back in the 90s, okay, um, that it was somebody who had foul play because it looked fresh. They actually took it and they um, did some carbon dating on it, and they found out that this guy was actually alive at about um, 3,000 to 5,000 BC, just based on carbon dating. And they did a rendering because forensics is pretty good these days of what he probably looked like um, when he was alive. And this is what they, they put together, the forensic scientists. They figured that that's what they looked like. And, and they got an idea of um, some of his physical features. Okay. And that's again, based on um, carbon dating that aged this person. And then going back to the history and figuring out what type of um, society lived during that time. Okay. Um, of course, the most famous uh, thing that was carbon dated was the Shroud of Turin. Okay. So this is just, again, 50,000 years is about the, the limit of carbon dating. And based, based on that. So this is the Shroud of Turin. And for those of you who remember, the Shroud of Turin is the cloth that they wrapped Jesus in. And um, what they did, I don't really know the origins there, but they, they it's supposedly when, when Jesus was um, crucified, they took him down and they wrapped him in some linen fabric. And on the third day when he rose again, he radiated so much energy that it imprinted a image of his body on this shroud, okay? And what they did was a bunch of scientists tried to go in there and ask to carbon date some of the fabric of that shroud. And for the longest time, Vatican said no, because um, in the early days, carbon dating used too much material. But as the um, technology progressed, found out that they could use very, very small micrograms of material so that they didn't damage the, the fabric. And when they did the analysis, okay, they did the analysis, they did carbon-14 dating. They said, okay, uh, today, the amount, if 
a living plant, as remember, a living plant also has carbon. We're alive, alive today. Uh, it would have about 50,000 parts per trillion. That's PPT, parts per trillion. Okay. Uh, that particular shroud has about 46.114 parts per trillion based on that day it was analyzed back in 1988. So they did, they did the math. They, they, they figured, okay, this plant would have 50 parts per trillion. This shroud now has 46.114. Let's figure out the time that has elapsed for that. And when they did the math, this is basically it. They figured out first, what is the rate constant K based on T1 half? Remember that T1 half equals 0.693 over K, we know what T1 half is for carbon-14. It's 5,730, so we can calculate K, the rate of decay, and that's this right here. Now we can use that K in this equation. Okay, it's a lot of math, like I said. And that's the magical part about science. The math gives you an answer. You may choose not to believe it, but at least it gives you an answer. So we do this right here. We plug it into this equation and we get a T. We get a T right here. And guess what that T happens to be for the Shroud of Turin? Came out to the time that it has elapsed from 1988 to when, the, when this plant was first alive, because that's what the Shroud was made out of, uh, plant material, okay? Was 668.6 years which drew the conclusion that this cannot possibly exist during the time of Jesus because Jesus lived about 2,000 years ago. So it threw everybody off into a havoc in terms of what was going on because they said, no, no, the science is dumb. The, can't believe it. We're not going to accept it or anything. And the science says, but this is what the evidence present. This is the fact, okay? And then you... You know, I was watching the Discovery Channel because I have nothing better to do. And they actually had this episode in the Discovery Channel of the Shroud of Turin. And one thing that maybe the scientists back then didn't realize was that the Shroud was actually in two fires. What does that mean if it was in two fires? One, that's why part of it is actually scorched because um, the monks had to go in there and, and take it out from the chapel that was housing it. Whenever you have a fire, the material around it burns. And what does it produce? Soot, carbon. So I think what happens, a lot of people are just find this is that when the, the soot was spreading during this fire, then some of it actually got onto the fabric, which basically increased the amount of carbon-14 and made it, it offset it, okay? So instead of uh, it put, in new carbon-14 in there, rather than it, it basically lifted the amount of carbon-14, which means that the time lapse now is going to be smaller than if there was no contamination. And then they did some, uh, for those of you who are microbiologists, they did, they look really close at the fabric and found <laughs> microorganisms. And what are microorganisms made of? They're made out of carbon. So, the jury's still out on it, okay? They have interference in terms of what, um, what can cause the results to get messed up. So you can either take the, the, the result as it is or realize that there are things that are making it anomalous. But in that same, in that same episode that I saw, they actually took a forensic scientist and tried to make an image of Jesus based on this figure. And they did it right here. Okay, this is the image that they have. And if you look real closely, okay, that image, I kind of like um, was wondering about that image, okay, as it was cycling through because it looked very familiar. In fact, that image, maybe you guys don't know, maybe you're too, but your parents would know, looks like Kenny Loggins in his younger days, okay? So um, I just thought that was sort of funny. Anyway, let, let's move on and let's take a look at second order kinetics. Okay, let's take a look at second order kinetics. Second order kinetics means that the concentration of the chemicals to the second power. And if you do the math, 
you do this. And this is the mathematical equation. And if you do it in, in terms of y equals mx plus b, and you need to remember this because this is what you guys will do in experiment number uh, one, okay? You have this equation y equals mx plus b. And these are the graph that you will get, okay? This is the graph of just time versus concentration. But if you plot it against this type of equation, now you get a straight line where the slope again, slope is equal to the rate constant, but now it's positive, it's positive, okay? Um, and the intercept is the original concentration, the reciprocal of the original concentration. So this is the plot for first order kinetics, whereas zero and and first order kinetics gave you a negative slope. Second order kinetics gives you a positive slope, okay? So this is what the data will look like when you quadruple the concentration. Look what happens to the uh, rate. It goes up to the 16th power. When you take the concentration and raise it eight times, then it goes up to the 64th power. That's because it's the concentrations squared concentration squared, eight squared equals 64, four squared equals 16. Okay, so again, that's the equation that you will be using. Don't worry about deriving it. Just write down these equations somewhere because you will be using it, okay? So the half-life is equal to one over K over the original concentration. So only first order kinetics is independent of the concentration zero and second order kinetics depend on the original concentration. So this is uh, an example of the decomposition of NO2 to NO and one oxygen. This is what the data will look like, but when you put it in this form right here, okay, then you get a straight line. This, okay, and the, the slope is the um, rate constant. That's zeroth order kinetics. So uh, this is a, usually an in-class. I'm just going to go over this. Uh, and that's because you guys will have plenty of time to do prob problems like this in the lab and in your homework. So I just want to walk you through this. So this is uh, some experimental data. It's N2, N2O5. It's dinitrogen pentaoxide. And it's di decomposing to nitrogen dioxide and oxygen gas. Okay, so um, this that's not a balanced equation. You guys will need to balance that. But um, this right here tells you the time and the uh, concentration with respect to time. So this is the data that you have. So how do we determine whether it's zero, first, or second order kinetics? And we're only going to limit our problems to that. Well, the way you determine that is you plot these. So we'll put time here and we have N205 here. And we will have natural log N205 here. And we will have one over N205 here. And why are we doing that? Because if we have a plot in which the concentration versus time is a straight line, then we know it's zeroth order kinetics. But if it's not a straight line and we plot natural log of N205 versus time and that's a straight line, then it's first order kinetics. But if it's not a straight line and we plot one over N205 versus time and that's a straight line, then we know it's second order kinetics. So we actually have to generate the plot and see which one is the best fit for a straight line in order to determine the order of this particular reaction. And all we're looking at is one chemical in 205. So uh, let me just show you how that's done here. Okay. Um, we're going to basically answer these questions. And let me show you. Here are the, and again, the best way to do this is through an Excel spreadsheet. Back when I was an undergraduate, we didn't have an Excel spreadsheet. We had to do it by paper and hand, and uh, it was very tedious. But these days, you guys have spreadsheet, and you can do it in an instant. So these are the different concentrations. I didn't put one over N205 here, okay? Because 
someone would, well, here it is. So this is my spreadsheet. And then I went ahead and plotted it. So this is for M205 versus time. This is natural log N205 versus time. And this is one over N205 versus time. You're going to get confused in the next chapter because we have another variable T. And T in that chapter is temperature. T in this chapter, lowercase t, is time. So let's take a look at this. You can see that in this right here, that's not quite a straight line. That's actually a curved line. Let's take a look at this. This right here looks somewhat straight. OK? And this right here is definitely not straight. So I can tell you right now, just based on these graphs, it's first order kinetics. And if I can figure out what the slope is, I have my rate constant. And basically, this is experiment number one. Okay, this is what experiment one is about. And here are the results. Let me clean this up. Okay, and since look at the correlation factor, correlation factor is how you determine how well the data points fit a straight line. The more nines that you have in the correlation factor, the better the fit. So this one's 0.893. So the first number there is an eight. That's really bad. Here, the first and second number are eight. That's really bad as well. But here, you have three nines. Remember, for those of you in lab, I said that the goodness of fit, if you have 1.0, it's perfect. You usually don't have 1.0, but you can quote the, the goodness of fit based on the nines. If you have three nines, 0.999, something, something, it is a really good fit. That's what this is. This is three nines. And we can just get the slope right here, 0 0.0304, and that's the rate constant. So take a look at that. It'll be on Zoom as well, because you guys are going to be doing this for experiment one and some of the activities, OK? This is a summary of what we just talked about, OK? Everything's compiled. It's also in your lab manual. If you go to the lab manual and you go to the very back, there's a summary of equations that you guys will be using for this course, OK? But that basically is um, zero first and second order kinetics.